Okay, uh, we're four minutes past the hour, so I propose we uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, just for the record, for the afternoon, we'll be five minutes behind schedule, but we have a very long Q&A session at the end with a panel, so I think that's okay. All right, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Thiessen. I'm an associate professor at the medical school at Dartmouth. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist by training, but also a passionate educator. And uh, I will show today some, a use case of large language models uh, in medical training and how we can leverage that in that domain. Uh, just want to acknowledge first some team members. Uh, uh, Simon Stone here and, and Nunsama Alilonu, um, second year medical students and funding uh, agencies as well that supported that work. <clears throat> We're very grateful. So in my lab, we started around like 10 years ago using uh, machine learning supervised methods to detect epileptogenic malformation, so uh, lesions on MRI automatically, and have shown that this can actually improve the detection uh, of these lesions uh, compared to expert radiologists. Um, <clears throat> since then, we've used this also uh, uh, unsupervised clustering uh, uh, algorithms to look at mental health features uh, in medical students um, and also now equipping our medical students with wearable devices and, uh, and track their mental health and physical psychophysiology uh, with that. So in my lab here, uh, the Nile lab, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, in a nutshell studying how to what are the optimal conditions for learning, both, both in terms of physiology, cognition, pedagogy, technology? And today I'm sharing with you a technology application. So um, in medical school, one of the hardest skills to teach our students is how to do uh, patient interviewing, right? Uh, they learn a lot of facts, but still it's a human interaction uh, business where this Patient comes in, you don't know anything else about the patient, their background, their disease, and you have to engage with that person, develop a personal relationship uh, with them of trust and compassion, and at the same time, uh, diff develop differential diagnoses in your head, right? Uh, kind of asking questions about the different diseases, get answers, process that answer, uh, go back, uh, reevaluate your hypotheses, your, your rankings, all of that while actually being a decent human being and I'm being compassionate and empathetic too, right? So that's really difficult. Um, so we are using standardized patients at the medical school there, which are human actors. Uh, they are basically trained to act in a specific way uh, with symptoms and personality and, and things like that. Um, and <clears throat> that provides a really realistic and somewhat safe learning environment before we let them lose on real patients, right? Uh, so, and we can consistently assess their progress. We can also give them formative feedback for improvement. Uh, the challenges of that approach is that it's very resource intensive, right? Providing this kind of uh, learning opportunities for our 92 medical students uh, requires a lot of work, a lot of resources. Uh, and then even when it works, there's limited availability too to kind of for these learning uh, opportunities. And then of course, they are also kind of medium stress because there's a whole pop, uh, a lot of um, you know stress there. They are often also evaluated right away on their skills, and it, so it's not a very low stress environment. Um, so what we kind of thought then is, hey, can we actually do an intermediate step and use technology to train our students to get to a certain level of competency in a patient? A physician interaction with technology before they come to the to the standardized actors and then before they come to the patient. So what we developed is this app here. Let me just click on it. Um, here we go. We call it the AI patient actor. Uh, you can choose like different cases here from a drop-down menu. Uh, we're going to go with the demo case today. You can choose different languages and I'll come back to kind of the reason for the selection of these particular languages, you can have uh, text-only input or sp speech and text input. We'll do that today. And then also you can hear the patient response in audio if you want. Um, so here we go. 
So, hi, I'm Dr. X. What brings you to the clinic today? So, the scenario is the patient comes in. I haven't seen the patient before. Um, and here we go. Can I go? I'm sorry to hear. How long has this been going on? Oh, I'm sorry to hear. That must be difficult for you. Oh, well, um, I, there must be something, but let me tip, tip that, uh, type that. Must be difficult for you. So then I go here, um, and there, there are certain ways we want our student to engage in. One is asking open-ended questions. Can you tell me more about your symptoms? Okay, anything else? Okay. So now I'm starting to develop a differential diagnosis. Hmm, could this be Alzheimer or has the patient hit their head? Right, so I, I ask, um, did you have any recent accidents? Nope, okay. Uh, do you have a family history of dementia? Right. Okay, right, so that kind of goes a little bit higher on my list of differentials, right? And then now, let's say I want to know, do a physical examination. Uh, I click here. Right, get that. Right, and I'm, I'm teaching the neuroscience and neurology course, so I'm, I'm a particular stickler for the neurological examination, so we have a lot of things there. Other diagnostic tests like imaging and so on is in there as well, right? Um, so let's let's um, go back how we actually do this. Um, you you see that here every case that we have follows uh, a, a particular template that is pre-configured uh, using basically experts, uh, educators, and physicians using something like that. So this is kind of the case you've just seen. All the information that was kind of relevant to the patient and their diagnosis uh, was based on this text file, right? So, um, and then we create a whole case library. Uh, for example, in my neuro course, I give students three, um, three cases per week related to conditions they've experienced, they, they learned about, and the students go and they don't know what that is. I don't give them that list. Uh, and they have to kind of figure out and diagnose the patient. Um, it's fun. Uh, and what's really interesting is here that the way we generate the medical knowledge is not through the LLM, right? Uh, we, we basically uh, have this here. This is for my colleagues, and I use it too. I've created this little bot here, which is basically, you know, you just, it's like a GPT in a way. Uh, I just say, hey, give me a case about Alzheimer's disease. And then it creates it following that template that really fits well with the AI patient actor, right? Um, so, right, and then I can do that with all diseases and build a, a library that way. Um, so, what's really the concept here is that with those patient clinical cases, we don't want ChatGTP to create that based on the, the medical knowledge, which might be faulty, biased, uh, and so on. So we always call what we have the professor in the loop or the a human in the loop there uh, before it goes to the patient actor. Uh, so that, that means the clinical information is always accurate and vetted by an expert. Uh, we don't rely on the L LLM. Uh, we, we tried that at first, but then it would not create re reliable results. And us, as it wouldn't give us the control over the cases uh, that we wanted the students to have. 
as well. So we only use the LLM basically leverage it for its conversational abilities. Um, so for the connoisseurs uh, amongst here who uh, program these kind of things, uh, we basically have the medical student here, the architecture, we have voice input, it it's also works on a computer or on a smartphone, uh, you know, and then uh, basically everything is wrapped up in a Python application where we lose Streamlit at the front end for the web interface, Langchain uh, uh, at the back end uh, where we have the case files and the prompt tunes in there. Um, and then that, that interacts all with the API from OpenAI, both for GPT-4 Turbo and for, for Whisper uh, for the voice recognition. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, ah. And then I want to show you now, uh, let's go back to the conversation from before, right here. And I'm just saying, this is just for demonstration purposes. Um, I don't think you have any problems and are only imagining it. Go home, right? <laughs> so, right, I, I'm root, violation of professionalism. I just put that in there because we come back to that in a second. All right, it's intimidated now. Um, but once we've done this, we can actually also, we go here, up, uh, end the encounter and receive feedback. So we go there and it asks for the diagnosis. I think it's Alzheimer's disease and submit this. And now it evaluates, gives me performance individually based on kind of what just happened. And you see how specific it references the conversation. So it's very individualized precision feedback. And then hopefully somewhere in there it shows also, um, oh here, right? See this? So it picked up that there was some un unprofessionalism. Uh, it, it, it really caught that and it gives feedback that this wasn't appropriate. Um, you know, it, it gives, basically differential diagnoses that you could have thought about, uh, questions you should have, that you should have asked but haven't asked uh, to help you develop this and so on. So, so basically the form of a feedback is combines uh, basically a log file of the interaction, right, that's saved uh, with a rubric that we take taken from the real standardized patient encounters uh, where students are, 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 are scored and basically told ChatGTP to uh, evaluate the encounter and the student's performance based on that rubric, right? And that cause introduced, has things like introduction, building rapport. You can see here we have some one-shot learning examples of that in there uh, and, 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 and all that. And the students can kind of choose uh, what they kind of um, cho do, do with that, uh, improve. They can go, just go back right away and try, okay, I'm gonna be more empathetic now. How would that look like? Okay, I gotta ask some other questions about the history and so on. So just some final thoughts here. Um, the app is not intended to replace the standardized patient or training with real patients, right? Uh, it can just, is, is an intermediary step for, to prepare students uh, to have the confidence and the skills uh, to interact with real human beings because that's very important and there's a lot that uh, the AI cannot do um, that's important there. Um, and I think it also demonstrated Gen I use case uh, that improves human interaction, right? It's not like the AI girlfriend that kind of, uh, you know, reduces your, your human interactional action skills, but it actually teaches you uh, to be better with your patients in the future. And for now, I think it highlights the importance uh, that we have to have a human in the loop, um, especially when it comes to high risk decision like medical uh, training and diagnoses, at least for now. Um, we'll talk about in five, 10 years and then we're there, it might actually be different. Um, then we talk about the AI in the loop, uh, how important that is. Um, and 
also something um, that's a little bit of a tangent, but because we have so many uh, kind of undergraduate med educators here and, 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 and professors, I think it also we, we really need to uh, teach our doctors and medical students about AI and machine learning um, because, as you can see here, this is kind of a chart of number of FDA clearances for medical devices using AI and machine learning, kind of, it, it really takes off, um, but it meets, sorry, it meets a workforce of doctors that is really not prepared to critically evaluate these tools. It's kind of driven by companies. They say, oh, this is great. Uh, you, you, you diagnose everybody perfectly, um, but the doctors cannot really implement it and make uh, decisions based on it in a critical way. So please do before, uh, you know, prepare your pre-med students before they come to us uh, with AI and ML. We really would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so uh, the last slide, uh, what we're planning now, I wrote this out in my course that's finishing the final is on Wednesday. Uh, after that, we do like uh, extensive end of course evaluations of, uh, about this tool. Um, we are going to do a qualitative analysis with a focus group of students to kind of uh, see what, what went well, what didn't go so well, what future opportunities. And then we also um, do a comparison of the log files, um, how well the students did, how, or actually how well the patient, the AI patient did, uh, evaluated by board certified neurologists. Um, and then they're also using the same rubric to uh, score the students. And then we kind of correlated with what ChatGTP uh, did for feedback and rubric evaluation uh, and, and, and see how, uh, how that matches up. Um, then we also have a medical Spanish uh, pathway at our medical school, uh, Dartmouth, um, but it's in the Upper Valley in New Hampshire and it's very hard to find standardized patients who speak Spanish, right? So uh, that's why we have a Spanish language in there. So we're trying that in there and giving our uh, future physicians who want to work with Spanish speaking uh, patients in the future kind of opportunities to practice that. We're also ro rolling it out uh, with a new medical school collaborating with educators there in Kenya, hence the Swahili uh, uh, language there and uh, it's open access. So um, uh, and we hope then that medical educators will be able to build their own cases uh, around that and, and, and use this. So if anybody hears this and want to work and collaborate and uh, design their own cases and work uh, with their students using the I, this app, uh, please, please do reach out. Thank you very much.